Hello class. This is lesson uh, 19 of our study in the book of Philippians and actually we will be finishing the book of Philippians today. Oh. <laughs> we will move on to something else. I just need a couple of weeks of, uh, of rest and then uh, we will see what the Lord has for us next and I will inform you of when that, when that will be ready. Um, up to this point in the book of Philippians, we have talked a lot about joy. Um, today we're focusing more on contentment because that is what Paul focuses on. If we're uh, challenged to find joy in uh, life, then how much more challenged are we to find contentment? Um, contentment being a, a general state of uh, satisfaction and happiness, satisfaction, contentment. No more than joy can be found in um, possessions or power or prestige or relationships or jobs or freedom from uh, difficulties, problems, and challenges. Um, neither can contentment for a very good reason because we can never be free from problems, difficulties, and challenges. They, they are always there for us. And so contentment is sometimes very elusive for us to enjoy. However, the Bible is full of uh, references to contentment, and a good number of them are actually commands for us to be contented. And I'm going to, let's see, I have uh, four or five of them here. So I'll just read the reference and then just go ahead and read the, um, read the verse and see what the different uh, New Testament authors say about contentment. Luke 3, 14. This is John the Baptist answering a question of the, so, from the soldiers concerning a genuine repentance. He says, Paul, this is John the Baptist, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. First Timothy 6, 8, obviously Paul. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Uh, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Paul again in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And Paul again to um, his, uh, his friend, Pastor Timothy, in 6 6, 1 Timothy 6 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So as Paul brings this letter to his beloved Philippian church to a close, he wants them to understand that in spite of his uh, very severe circumstances, um, he's content. He is free from anxiety and worry. So not only is he experiencing joy in spite of his circumstances, but he has no anxiety or worry because he is content. Um, he proceeds to give us five different principles of contentment. Four or five, I'm actually not sure. Uh, first of all, in verse 10 of chapter 4 of Philippians, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So Paul is talking directly to the Philippians here. Um, they have been very consistent in their financial support of Paul and his ministry up until maybe about actually 10 years from the time that he is writing this letter. Um, and so uh, he's been in Rome and um, uh, evidently either he has no reason, uh, no understanding of why they haven't contributed, but that hasn't been a concern of his. Uh, maybe they, we know that they were not a wealthy church. Uh, perhaps they had other things that they needed to use that money for. Uh, we don't know. Um, maybe they ha were unaware of what his financial needs were. Maybe they were not sure of where he was or how they even could, or if, if they could even get aid to him. 
Uh, again, we don't know the reasons behind their lack of financial support for him, but evidently they have um, Epaphroditus <laughs> from the Philippian church has arrived in Rome with a generous gift from the Philippian church. And Paul is doubly thankful. Uh, he's, uh, he's thankful, he says, um, it, it meets his needs, uh, yes, um, but it also gives um, evidence of their love for him. And to Paul, honestly, it was more uh, heartwarming to know that they cared than actually the, the gift itself, because he was contented without the gift. Not that he didn't appreciate it, he does, but uh, the fact that they would care enough to make that collection and send Epaphroditus to him with it, uh, it meant even more to him than the gift itself. He assures them that he knows that even though they weren't able to give before, he knows that they still cared. He never doubted that because they weren't sending a gift that it meant that they didn't care. Um, if he had been um, asked, he would have said, the fact that they haven't said anything is beside the point. I know that I know the Philippians and I know that they are still uplifting me in prayer and care about my ministry. Um, so one of the things that we need to remember regarding commitment, commitment, contentment is that it comes from trusting God. How could we be content other than by trusting God for our needs? Paul says in verse 11 of chapter 4, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul assures the Philippians that the lack of resources was not something that caused him anxiety. He was not worried because he had so many things that he wanted to do and he didn't have the resources to do them uh, because whatever it is that he wanted to do came second to what it is that God wanted him to do. And should God want him to do something, then God would provide the means to, for him to be able to do that. And he knew that. Our society is concerned with a lot more than just needs, aren't we? <laughs> um, ask any teen or young adult to, to make a list of uh, his, need, his or her needs, and no doubt it will include a, an iPhone and a computer and a, a comfortable bed and more than one pair of shoes, no doubt. Um, it might even include a well-paying job and a satisfying relationship and an opportunity to express oneself. Oh, who knows? We could go on and on and on of what people consider to be their needs um, when they, they are wants. They are not. They are not needs. There is a huge difference between a need and a want, although these days that differentiation is kind of blurred. So what do we end up? We end up like a hamsters running in a wheel and going nowhere <laughs> because we're concentrating on providing for our wants. Uh, the chief end of man is to do what? The chief end of man is to glorify God, period, um, and enjoy him forever, <laughs> um, not have his wants met. No, that's not, that's not a promise that's found anywhere in Scripture. Paul worked hard. Um, he was satisfied with little, um, and he trusted God to uh, control the results. He was obedient, and that is all that was required of him. Uh, if that was, uh, if that is what he did, then he was content, and he was content to know that God would any results, anything that came as a result of his efforts, um, was God's God's deal and not his. Another thing is that Paul wants us to know when he, he, he tells us in verse 12 is that contentment is not based on circumstances. Certainly Paul has made this very clear that his joy was not dependent on his circumstances and neither is his contentment. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In every and any circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. Uh, neither living above nor living below his circumstances affects his, uh, his contentment. 
So, if that's the case, then his content, his circumstances cannot steal his contentment. If his contentment is not dependent on his circumstances, then his circumstances are not controlling his contentment. Um, he's had both experiences. Uh, he was hardly a prosperity preacher. <laughs> Uh, he was not an ivory tower theologian either. Uh, no, he was, uh, he, um, he ministered in the trenches, I guess you could say, about Paul. He ministered to anyone and everyone that would hear what it is he had to say. And because of that, he was run out of towns. He was stoned and imprisoned, and he suffered all kinds of mishaps on his journeys. And um, he has listed, uh, <laughs> listed, I would say he's listed all of them, but I doubt that they were all of them. Uh, but he certainly did um, minister in the trenches and not in the palaces. Um, and yet he had risen above all those circumstances. He tells the Corinthians in um, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for uh, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. <laughs> Light, momentary affliction. To Paul, anything that we may have to endure here on earth is nothing more than a light, momentary affliction. When we compare it to the glory that is beyond all comparison uh, that we would find in heaven. Hmm. Uh, number three, a contented person is strengthened with divine power. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. A uh, very often quoted verse, isn't it? I can do all things through he who strengthens me. Um, our ministry uh, is uh, adequate and sufficient because the power uh, that makes it adequate comes from the one who is adequate and sufficient. Not us, but God. He is the almighty, um, adequate, and sufficient one. <laughs> he is all and enough. John, Mac John MacArthur speculates that uh, Paul's thorn in the flesh may very well have been a demon. We do know that it was connected with Satan may have been a demon who uh, was behind the false teachers in Corinth who was uh, trying to tear down that church that he loved so much. Um, they, they were even claiming that uh, Paul was teaching a poor doctrine, um, a heresy, which, of course, Paul would never, never even think of doing. Paul ate, not for the insult to himself, um, but for the church that he had established and loved so much and for the, um, for the, uh, the insult to, uh, to God to try to make people believe something that was just not true. Paul begged God to remove this demon, this thorn in the flesh, this aggravating demon from him. And what did God do? God replied to Paul's request uh, by reminding him that his grace is sufficient. Those are the words of God to Paul. My grace is sufficient. And so Paul says to the, uh, to the, um, to the, um, the, the Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, whose strength is sufficient, in other words. Uh, we can only be reassured of God's sufficiency by consistently living a godly life and allowing him to show us how adequate and sufficient his grace is for us. So godly living is a prerequisite, prerequisite of, of, um, of being totally dependent on God who strengthens us. Number four, God cannot be outgiven. <laughs> God cannot be outgiven. Uh, Paul says this in verse 14, Yet it was kind of you, Philippians, to share my trouble. Uh, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. 
Even in Thessalonica, you kept, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Um, Paul begins this little passage here, begins in verse 14, with the word yet. Uh, maybe your translation says, nevertheless. Uh, nevertheless, it was kind of you to share my trouble. Yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. It seems as if Paul wants to make clear to the Philippians that um, uh, maybe this, there's something that he said that they might possibly have misunderstood. And so he wants to straighten that out, lest there be any kind of misunderstanding. He doesn't want them to think that he neither, need, neither needed nor appreciated their offering. Um, after all, he says that he was content without it, doesn't he? So it makes it could, if somebody wanted to read between the lines, make it sound as if Paul was saying, well, I know you sent this gift, but I don't really need it. I was pretty happy without it. That's not what Paul's saying at, at all. Um, verse 17 says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Um, Paul is doubly thankful again. Um, um, it is, um, it is blessed to, it's blessed to receive, certainly, but it is blessed to give. And so Paul is not only thankful for the gift that they have given him that will be well used, but also for the blessing that they will receive knowing that their sacrificial um, offering is being utilized, um, being utilized um, well. Um, while Paul will be blessed um, materially um, in being able to finance his ministry, the Philippians will be blessed spiritually by their sacrificial, uh, by basically by a living sacrifice that they have offered, that they have uh, withheld from themselves what could have been bought for themselves in order to be able to contribute to, to Paul's ministry. Verse 18, I have received full payment, um, sort of like a, a stamp that says uh, paid in full, and more, I am well supplied. Um, Paul says the, 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 the giving, the gift was uh, an abundance, an, 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 um, an excess, more than sufficient, more than enough for him to do what it is that he uh, was setting out to do. Um, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a, fa a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Here Paul is um, just plain overwhelmed by their generosity, and, and he recognizes the sacrificial nature of their offering and considers it indeed to be a, a living sacrifice. Verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And again, God cannot be outgiven. And um, in such knowledge, Paul is content. He knows that there is nothing that he could do that would uh, cause God to owe him anything because God cannot be outgiven. Picking up in uh, Philippians 4, verses 20 to 23, uh, he's, Paul is bringing his letter to a close. And so he says in verse 20, To our God and Father, uh, be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a doxology. And as like all doxologies that come at the end of uh, Paul's letter or Peter's letter for that, that matter, um, Paul is thankful to be able to lay those doxologies doctrines down. He is as thankful to be able to lay those doctrines down as the Philippians will be to receive them. And so he gives all glory to God for the opportunity um, to teach and uh, for the, the blessings that he anticipates will be received by those who hear his teaching. Uh, the doxology, uh, doxology of any teacher or pastor or elder um, just thankfulness to be able to be given the opportunity to to teach, um, and and um, and sending along with that uh, thankfulness that uh, someone will benefit from that teaching. Verse twenty one, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. 
All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. <laughs> Interesting. Um, remember Philippi, as I mentioned way, way back at the very beginning, was a Roman colony. The citizens of Philippi were Roman citizens and benefited greatly from being Roman citizens. They were Roman citizens first before they were Philippian citizens, so to speak. So they enjoyed many privileges. Um, Caesar's household doesn't only refer to his family. It refers to those who were um, employed by, uh, by Caesar, um, from the lowly slave all the way through to the high-ranking freeman. Um, during his imprisonment, Paul would have come in contact with many of the household of, of Caesar, especially the Praetorian Guard. Remember that he was um, accompanied, chained to uh, two Praetorian Guards uh, 24-7 for four years when he was in Rome. Uh, there were many Praetorian Guards who um, heard Paul teach and preach and saw him minister to those who visited him in the apartment that he was that he was in and evidently many of those praetorian guards as long as uh, with other members of caesar's household had been uh, rescued from the dark depths of sin and into the kingdom of jesus christ and paul is thankful for all who have and especially for the, the, those that uh, were part of Caesar's household. Just think about it. Uh, what an example of God's providence that uh, these men would hear the word of God um, while chained to Paul as a part of their employment. <laughs> Whenever would they ever have had the opportunity to hear Paul preach? Um, when would they have ever taken advantage of the opportunity if such an opportunity had presented itself? No, uh, I, I doubt that 100%. And so Paul is especially thankful for the opportunity to be able to uh, minister to those uh, members of Caesar's household and those send their greetings also back to the Philippian church. So Paul concludes um, his lesson, his, uh, his, his letter to the Philippians. And actually, it's going to be the same way that I am going to conclude our series of 19 lessons in the book of Philippians. And so I say this to you, as Paul said it to the Philippians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen.